I'm interested more in the relational connection, but you probably already covered that in your slides. So there you go. No, I will have some time off. Okay, here we go. We are live. Um, thanks for joining us again at Austin Software Co-op. Um, this is October 2016, and we have Dan Lewis from Inspiral who's joining us to talk about the advice process and how it works in a dev um, consulting group. And we have some folks up in Taranga. Thanks for joining, and uh, several people here in the U.S. as well. Dan, I'll give it to you. Great. Hey, everyone. I'm going to. I've, I've got this annoying pop-up which is coming up every now and then, which is saying Google Hangouts is crashing, uh, but it's not. So I'm just going to keep on going, and if I need to, I will have to reboot Hangouts, which will be really sucky. But. Hello. Uh, I'm going to power up my slides, and uh, this will be a short presentation. And I am really open, would love to hear questions towards the end. So um, uh, what I'm, talking, I'm here to talk to you today about is the advice process and why I consider it to be the thing that made our uh, little software service co-op happen uh, over anything else. So. The plan uh, over, like, essentially what I'm here to talk to you about uh, in brief is I'm going to talk about me. I'm going to talk about my group, which is called Root Systems. I'm going to talk about the advice process. Uh, I'm going to talk on applying the advice process. And then I'm diving into uh, trust and agreements, commitments, and roles, which are kind of more, um, yeah, more my coming towards my opinion or and of like there's some and agreements, commitments, and roles are to do with uh, I suppose the building blocks of how we document things and how we uh, yeah how we build that common knowledge and basic understanding. So uh, who am I? I'm Dan, also known as Daniel Lewis, and I wasn't expecting so many keys here, so I was going to like crack a good joke about the risk board uh, that usually is not on there. Um, but there's so many Kiwis here that it's a bit, I don't know, I suppose it's still funny. Um, so I'm actually originally from England, and my entire understanding of geography was based on risk. And so when my dad said, we're moving to New Zealand, I was like, where is that? It's not on the risk board. Um, I trained in architecture, uh, building buildings, uh, designing buildings. And uh, my kind of ambitions and drives are around better homes and stronger communities and transparent systems, and those are slightly synergistic with uh, my group, which is root systems. Uh, if you have your mic on, if you can just knock it off, and then we won't have any feedback. So the developer cooperative that I formed uh, with these other people here and is called root systems, and it's uh, entirely owner-run. And it started on the 8th of December. We started within another organization called Inspiral Dev Academy. Um, and two of us were used to be teachers. Three of us were students at some point, And uh, three of us now are also members of the Inspiral Foundation uh, Cooperative as well. We call ourselves a livelihood pod. And what a livelihood pod is is they, that you are committed to sharing and supporting each other's livelihood. So it's, it, it, I kind of think of it as like a working family, where if one of you has no work, the others are going to uh, carry that person and support that person. And it's, it's very holistic. Oh, you know what doesn't work in presenter mode is I don't get my notes. I had notes. OK, well. This is going to be all of memory. So we, we've kind of termed livelihood pod. Uh, the history of, lively, of the pods is that on the 8th of December, Inspiral Dev Academy had an experiment, which we called podification, where we broke the company into several parts inside. And basically, uh, each part was a self-organizing pod. And they would manage their own finances, manage their own business activities, and our particular pod around consulting 
uh, really kind of took to this and owned it and over the next few months really started to consolidate an identity as a group. Uh, within, um, yeah, so a bit more history on that. When we first formed the group on the 8th of December, within three months, we were in debt for $35,000 to the main company. Uh, that was to do with the fact that our, we didn't, we, well, we had only just formed as a consulting group and we, no one was really managing the pipeline properly. And, um, and so in March of this year, kind of because of the, this kind of crisis, if you like, of like, oh my God, we're just not viable. We had to do some hard pivoting using lean method uh, terminology and base. And that set us on a course of discovering our own identity, our own values, our common trajectory, uh, many conversations, developing high trust, talking about ambition. Uh, we did several exercises, uh, potentially hundreds of our collective hours went into this process where we talked about like, you know, timescales of 10 to 50 years and talking about like, what does it mean if we're the same group of people in the same livelihood pod in 20 years? What do we want to have accomplished? What is the purpose of all of this? We discovered that uh, most of us, <laughs> not, I can't say all, <laughs> but 80% uh, of us at the time were very interested, or 70%, three and a half, were very interested in cooperatives. Um, Sarah at the front uh, is an administrator of two cooperatives and uh, buying groups in Petoni and Wellington. Um, Mikey at the back, the real tall one, uh, he was part of a student housing cooperative in uh, Ber Berkeley, I think. And, and then I've, I haven't participated in any formal cooperatives, but I kind of, I've been belonged to many social uh, societies and sp around sword fighting reenactment and running, like participating in how to run communities in there. And we worked out that uh, one, Sarah had a huge problem with uh, these cooperatives and they were just administration nightmares. And she said, well, why don't we work on this thing together? And from there, we started to discover that one of the common purpose, we didn't have a common purpose. And through this kind of discovery of talking about building this thing that is now called Kobai, we realized that uh, we were very interested in the supply chain and how things move and how information is transferred through systems. And so we kind of hit on this idea that the purpose of our group was to develop base tools within the supply chain uh, around information communication through transactions, essentially. And kind of then this f kind of first product called Cobuy to help buying groups manage themselves and buy together. Uh, and essentially radically chain, invert the control of the supply chain away from corporate or big corporates to essentially the, the buying groups themselves that have all the buying power to begin with. So that, that's kind of who we are and what we do now uh, and how we got there is kind of why I'm here today. So bring on the advice process. When we formed in the 8th of December, it was a complete nightmare. It was absolute chaos. Uh, it was horrible. We had all these massive meetings talking about, uh, it wasn't just the five of us at the time, there were a whole bunch of people that were kind of umming and ahhing, are they in, are they out? And they were showing up to meetings and, and everyone would like be posing scenarios of what happens in this situation, what happens in that situation, uh, trying to like preemptively solve every possible problem. And in kind of talking to some people within Inspiral and specifically within, also within Lumio and reading uh, publications from Lumio really started to get into this idea that this consensus thing that we were, we were basically pursuing consensus uh, and pursuing hypothetical scenarios and together they were both in, exhausting us to the point where we just wanted to abandon everything. And the advice process uh, kind of was what really started to synergize with us well. Uh, that part of that was because, particularly with me and in my role in the group, I'm 
what I term an active owner, and I'll go into that in a sec later. And so I kind of did some reading and I decided that this, this um, advice process thing could really work for us. It would mean that I could start making some decisions, start getting stuff going, uh, and that the responsibility I had was to uh, talk to people and get understanding from everyone. At the moment, uh, most of the decisions sit with me. It's not quite as uh, free and everyone's doing stuff as we would like. And that's more just because uh, of the nature of how we've moved and how we had to move fast. Uh, we consolidated a lot of the decision making onto me around business and strategy, allowing freeing up other people to focus primarily on dev, but that doesn't stop anyone from participating or making a decision, and they just have to go through the advice process of seeking advice. Now, because I've lost my notes, I'm not going to be able to read out the quotes. I'm going to just escape out of presenter mode so I can read it off of, this is one of the links that I sent through. This, uh, this here, anybody can make any decision if they have all the advice they need to make a good decision for the business. This includes asking those impacted or with expertise. It's pretty much spot on my definition of the advice process at this point in time. Um, this was a blog that was shared with me, um, funnily enough, by two different people, uh, one at Lumio and one at Dev Academy. Uh, who are both also very interested in these kind of, this process. So, like teasing that out, there's a there's a thing around in a, the advice process of you you kind of need two things, and it's not I've, I've kind of there's kind of a for me I've been, I was recently talking about this that you need to have a moment or a, a time where you can participate in some sort of decision making. Because anybody can make a decision is true. However, what also happens is sometimes you have someone that's been making a decision or is holding a responsibility over time, and they just continue to make, uh, make decisions. And unless there is a clear invitation to participate, it's very hard for those who um, don't aren't, aren't sitting with making those decisions to kind of feel that they've got that power to follow the advice process and 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 so the 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 kind of the you need a dec a good cadence and a good way of communicating and giving people context so that they can essentially onboard themselves into the decision making process and that's kind of encapsulated in that definition of saying you you know you have a responsibility to seek advice from all those who would be impacted or would have expertise in the decision that you wish to make. Uh, a point of note, these pictures are from Lumio, love Lumio, and just wanted to say like Lumio is uh, a tool that can be used in this, but it, it can be used in many different other ways as well. Um, so onwards, walking the walk. Um, so after, so about March, we said, okay, there are five of us, and they're the four green blobs there, and then I'm the blue one. And essentially, the four blue blobs, the green blobs, the five of us owned the, the group uh, and the all funds of the group that we collectivized. Uh, and then essentially, uh, I held, I, I, we, we worked out I hold like 10 or so roles at the moment. Um, that I'm, we're, we're, we're going through a transitionary period of trying to like break those into smaller things that are manageable by other people and distribute those more evenly now. Uh, at, the t but at the time this, this worked because it meant that we could get on with getting dollars and getting out of that 35K hole, which was uh, step one. I, I think uh, one of, um, in fact, the purple person over here is, he, that's Damien. Uh, he is, we have, he's kind of outside our group, but we have a, service level agreement with him, and he kind of helps with business stuff. Um, and I'll talk about that a bit more, but he often talk, refers to the principle from permaculture of, first of all, you need to, the first thing you do, or the first principle, is obtain a yield. And he loves quoting that, and I, I totally, um, I speak quite closely to me now. 
So what happened was we defined the group and there's two rings here because we realized that this is what we had. There was no group and everyone was just ducking in and ducking out and it was a mess. So we defined a group, but that wasn't to say that we didn't have people that would kind of come and orbit us. And they, they're, they're what we call contributors or contractors and they work through us, but we don't uh, guarantee work for them, nor do we hold, uh, like, nor do we employ them over time, like, uh, give, uh, as salaried individuals. And then there's this person here who is the newest member of our, well, he's not a member yet, but he's transitioning in. So he's kind of uh, coming into the group and that's like a three month process. He's now working with us and we're all getting to know him and there'll be a, a final consensus on whether he gets to become a member or not. Uh, so that will not follow the advice process. Um, I'll dive into that a little bit later as well. So this is kind of what we have right now today after 10 months where we started is this. The future. This is what I'm trying to build with a group of other people right now. Um, Susan, who, uh, to answer Chris's earlier uh, ask, is the person that referred me, um, and that's kind of why I'm here talking today. Uh, she would be one of these purpley ones. This would be Josh over here, and Kate, and Jen, and, and this group over here, they call themselves the Golden Pandas, and then this is our group called Root Systems. And together, we are going to build something called Inspiral Labs. And so, in a way, that is us moving to, an, and this will be a new legal structure that encompasses the two groups. Both groups will still manage themselves internally, and they'll still have their own, uh, go through their own decision-making processes for how they manage funds and who gets to be a member of their group, their subgroup. And then there'll be a, uh, the, these kind of purpley links here are around who is uh, actively being responsible for the maintenance of the uh, the organization and you could think of the organization as the platform or the like especially around legal platform and infrastructure platform upon which you need to operate and so rather than us each having to have one we'll just share that um, and then obviously there's all kinds of other stuff um, that we can do by being inside the same uh, group, like more cross-pollination and certainly wanting to develop more pods as would, so um, would be another thing. Uh, this will still follow the advice process. Sorry, that's the, that's the whole point. Um, uh, the, the org would, would be managed by uh, a group of people at the moment called partners and they would follow the advice process for uh, deciding on maybe what projects you would pursue uh, as an org like individual pods could still have projects that they would want to want to pursue but um, the they would follow the advice process for spending discretionary funds so that might be uh, to have someone write content uh, or publish something or for someone to att and attend an event, an, a specific event, they would be responsible for making sure that com we're compliant, that our GST is getting paid, that, uh, yeah, that in a, lot, a lot of things to do with well-being should be responsible within the pods themselves. And the uh, the org should be kind of, and the, the subgroup of people, the purpley ones and the blue one over here in this case, would be looking at the kind of more the, the viability of the business activities, I suppose, would be one way of saying it. The pods themselves are livelihood pods. They should be looking after the members. The org should be looking after the businesses. And, and that's consulting products. Yeah, so the, the org would be worrying about do our customers having good experiences would be a thing that they would need to make sure was happening, uh, maintaining and building relationships. There would still be, and I haven't drawn it anywhere, unfortunately, there would still be directors. So this will be a limited liability company and there will still be directors. And you see this uh, in one of the links I sent through, which was the, uh, 
the um, this one over here, the software mill. They talk about this as well, where they have they they refer to themselves having forty CEOs, but then there are a group of owners, and in uh, a certain circumstances, those owners will essentially step in and take control of the company. Uh, they've never had to do this, but in essence, it's kind of like a final safety mechanism. And again, this is exactly the kind of model that we would employ of you. You're, you're, you're essentially electing a man, uh, an org management group. They don't manage group uh, pods, they manage the org. And then you have uh, directors who are ultimately responsible for the org. Uh, this is all very experimental and this is just like where we're going. Um, so that's that there. Right, trust. So this is kind of getting into a little bit of um, uh, maybe not what you are reading uh, or I don't know, maybe you are. Um, one of the things I've noticed over the last year within Inspiral but, and within Inspiral Dev Academy and within our livelihood pod is trust is a, a real interesting thing. It, and I started thinking of it as a double-edged sword because you can use it in really interesting ways. Within our group, for example, we our documented agreements are absolutely rubbish. But the trust that we have in our small group of five is so high that it doesn't really matter, as well as kind of a combination of the trust and the numbers means we can just have a meeting and decide something. So the need to have really good documentation and collective, like a, a collective knowledge base of how things work is, does, is not really, it's not really a thing yet. Whereas if you have 40 people in a company, it's much more important or more obviously. Trust within, so I, I think that the way that we've been talking about it now is we refer to ourselves as a high trust livelihood pod. And within that pod, trust is a very, uh, can be used very, very well is, and very easily, I think is kind of what I'm getting at. As you scale that, I you, you, you need to be a bit more careful. I think that um, trust can obf obfuscate problems it can, trusting in processes that are too complex or unreliable can, can just like do massive damage when things go wrong. And the other way that I would be thinking about trust is it's a finite commodity, or maybe you could think about it as a well, and it's a common thing that anyone can draw on at any point in time, because following the advice process, everyone's got that power. So anyone can say, trust me to do this, and because they have the power to make that decision, it's it's not like you can stop them. So, like a, a lot of a lot of groups and like the, those uh, two blog, blog posts I posted, one, um, one of them talk about this. Um, is that you, you? A lot of people worry about the scenario where what happens when person over X over there does the thing that I just totally disagree with, and a lot of people overthink the response of like, okay, we'll have a conflict resolution process or we'll have uh, something, something, something. The truth is that the advice process is self-adjusting over time. That means that one time you might make a decision that someone else does not like, but the decision has been made. However, by talking about it and that person saying like, hey, that decision you made, I actually disagreed with it and I wish you had talked to me. That is a very, that's in fact, I would argue that it's the responsibility of the, of the other members of the group to give you that feedback so that you know to go and talk to them about such a thing in the future. Why that happened was either uh, you, so I think this is a bit of a smell for me of like where trust hasn't worked. So in the moment, for example, within my group, I operate with a lot of, there's a lot of trust put in me and the kind of things I do. And I wear that quite heavily and take it very seriously. And there have certainly been moments where I've acted and I've done things. And then someone's kind of called me out on it and said like, Hey, you know, you did this thing. Can you just explain why? And, um, and I'd be like, well, you know, 
if you trust me, you know, it wasn't really questioning my trust. It was more like they want, they wanted to understand why I, the decision making process, the smell for me in that is I was not having any kind of cadence of, uh, a way for people to participate in the decision making process. So it's exactly the problem of I'm making decisions all the time and I'm, I go and seek advice all the time, but because the, the various decisions that I'm having to deal with are not transparent, I'm not transparent about it. It makes it very hard for people to invite themselves into participation and invite themselves into making decisions. So I haven't, my messaging around the trust thing is still, I'm still evolving this, so I, I'm really be interested to hear what people say. Um, basically, it's just like, think of trust as a precious thing. Uh, if you lose it, it's very hard to get it back. Lastly, this is, uh, and this is, I was kind of running out of time this morning, too, so this is my last slide. Agreements, commitments, and roles. Uh, this is essentially the DNA of how we uh, think of our organization and we haven't got many agreements because we just haven't had time to document them um, Oh, I've got one more slide. Sorry. I've got one more. I've got the example slide of uh, My financial agreement So agreements are essentially our constitution that agreements are set by full consensus at the pod level of five I would be looking for uh, absolute consent uh, for these I would at the org level I would be more uh, I would be more okay with a uh, maybe you haven't got absolute consent from everyone in it maybe you've got uh, some abstains or some people that just feel out of context or something and that's okay but at the pod level it's a must that everyone understands these and agrees to them because this essentially is defining the common denominator the, the base common I've been thinking about it as an alignment and direction, uh, like in time or like what is your trajectory. Yeah, a big part of like forming a pod is, and forming the super, the pod of pods, if you like. It, one of the ways I've been thinking about it is it's increasing your power to affect reality, either to withstand it and it changing or to change it. You can think of money in a little bit of the same way, but I think people are so much, it's like that's way more important than money because like you can get money from, from by doing things, but really your ability to make change is about people. And by forming a group, you are, I th there's definitely some sort of factor where forming a group of five gives you a reality distortion field of nine or something, I don't know. But you can definitely, and your agreement is essentially how you're pooling that together to act as one. Commitments are basically contracts. Uh, they're commitments to each other, there's commitments to outside, outside groups, so like forming a service level agreement with a third party to provide something, something, something. They're basically contracts, at some point they expire or need to be renewed. Uh, good examples of contracts would be um, delegating a role internally or externally, uh, uh, deciding on how much someone gets paid, so setting a salary for someone with an annual renewal on it. Maybe it's uh, uh, setting a strategy for the quarter or for the year, that they would all be commitments. Lastly, roles. Uh, roles are basically, like I wrote it here, delegation from the group to a person of duties to be undertaken following the advice process. So why this is here and why that's different to a commitment uh, or commitments is, yeah, so the way I've been th thinking about this recently is agreements are like, you're, you're, you're thinking in such big time frames that it's meaningless. So you can think of them, agreements last for years, commitments last for months, and Roles are not really lasting for weeks, but they have a cadence of weeks. If you're responsible for managing finances, then the kind of activity of being in a role is regular. It's I'm a developer, or I'm a managing finances, or I send invoices, or I do reports, or something that's a role, and I follow the advice process in my role, and that's got some sort of uh, week 
or combination of weeks cadence, something along the lines of uh, sprints like in Agile. Whereas commitments, you might have a quarterly strategy commitment. And so that's kind of, and you might make a commitment on a salary for six months or a year. Um, and that, so I kind of see them as like three different uh, time, yeah, time uh, angles or, or ways of looking at uh, three different cadences for your organization in a way. And I'm still teasing out the language on this, interested in what you think. Um, lastly, uh, our first and our most important agreement, and also I think one of the uh, bizarrely just like lucked out in writing it to save us a lot of grief. Basically, instead of deciding on how much people got paid, I just wrote a formula. Um, and what was beautiful about this was we didn't need to negotiate with anyone. And in fact, what it does is because the individual receives a, uh, a revenue share of their activities, uh, which is, yeah. So basically, depending on how much money in the bank, you get a base salary. And then your base salary, you get more money here if there's more money in the bank. And then you get a revenue share, which is a percentage based upon money in the bank multiplied by the billable hours that you've achieved for a month. So this totally is designed for a service company. I, I would throw it out the window for a product company. But for a service company, this is brilliant because roughly the math worked out that if you were a junior dev or a, and you would be earning, say, um, six to six ish thousand dollars, six and a half thousand dollars a month. And if you're a senior dev, you could earn 10 to 11. And that's, and the wonderful thing about it was, oh, and then we're all contractors as well. So we don't track leave, we don't track time off. People just work or don't. And we, you can think of the base salary, we call it a salary, but you could actually think of it as a, um, a retainer, as, as, as probably more of like the real world terminology for that, is a retainer plus a commission is how we're doing it. But unlike sales, where you would operate the same model, we're inverting it and we're doing quite a high retainer and a, much, and a smaller commission. Um, I think it works out to be about the net result of this model is we end up paying about 70, 60 to 70% to the individuals. And where the other portion of that is paying for um, um, expenses and also, and the rest of the, the remainder is getting collectivized. And I'd say we're collectivizing at this point in time, like a 15, 15% is like our, essentially our profit margin as a group. Um, yeah, we wrote a Medium article. I'm just, I love it. I don't know why. It's only four minute read. If you haven't read it, have a, have a read. And um, yeah, that's it. I suppose, oh, sorry. I wanted to talk about the advice process, first, advice process on this financial model. It took me a month to write that because I, could, this was the most important agreement. It defined like, hey, you want to get it right. And by following the advice process and pursuing a algorithm, I just had to ask for input and all, and of what everyone thought and then wrote the algorithm. And what was wonderful about it was rather than everyone essentially deciding their own salary where they had to essentially negotiate with everyone else in the group, we got around that by basically following the advice process to write a formula that decides everyone's pay. So uh, the key requirement in pursuing that was to avoid negotiating internally. The way that this financial model or uh, formula works is that the higher rate you can charge out of the group, outside of the group, the better off everyone collectively is. And then the person doing the work is obviously getting 
they're getting a percentage of that as well. But the idea is that rather than ever negotiating internally, that never happens. We only ever get and negotiate externally. And, uh, and that felt really, really good that I'm negotiating on my colleague's behalf and um, I know that if I get a higher rate, they're going to be better off and I know that I'm going to be better off. And um, I mean, it sounds a bit cutthroat, but um, in, it's more about having clean uh, expectations and understandings around uh, so that, and that makes doing such business activities a lot easier. Um, that's it. Awesome. awesome. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan. How long was I? Um, Way longer than I thought I was going to be. I think about 35 dream. minutes. Dreaming if I think I can do that in 10. It's easier with the notes. Um, so, has anyone got a question? How many livelihood pods are there within the Inspiral network? Uh, I would say that Lumio and uh, Root Systems and, uh, and Ops. I'd say there's at least three, and Golden Pandas now. I'd say there's four across three or four different companies. And then there's other groups that are not operating like that. Because the way the characteristic of a livelihood pod is that it's essentially a worker co-op within a company, if that makes sense. So there's, you know, side by side with us now as a marketing department inside the Spiral Dev Academy, and that's op operating with a fixed budget and salaried employees. Dan, did you um, take any inspiration from Holacracy? Um, Oh, yep. Or yeah. yeah. So I I did quite a lot. Well, yes and no. I it was uh, this like this has evolved uh, over time, and the the mm -hmm. yeah we kind of definitely looked at holacracy buffer. We looked at uh, I'd say. Probably just because of our connections to Lumio, we took the most inspiration from them, um, and because they were just so, it was so easy to talk to them, <laughs> they were like right there. So, but yeah, yeah, uh, took inspiration. I would say the the, the thing that the, the re I was sitting in a meeting with someone from the states yesterday with another guy, and the my key piece of advice is don't try to like it's exactly what we fell victim to at the beginning is try to think of all the problems and design the perfect system. It's not going to happen. You form the group, you, you focus on developing trust, and you start evolving it together. Hmm. I'm not used to facilitating this. Maybe what we'll do okay. is if, if people don't know when to speak out, they can just jump uh, put uh, messages into the chat or just shout out. I've got a question. So if, if you hadn't been behind the eight ball and had to you know, get out of the 35K right away and kind of went to the sort of benevolent dictator model, um, yeah. <laughs> what would you have done? And, and can you, I, I know it's hard to think about the hypothetical, but do you think there were actually advantages to doing that that way, even if you weren't in that situation, or would you do it something else and know that you know? Well, if we had done it this way, there would have been these advantages. Yeah, great, great question. Yeah, great, um, great. I'd say, if you weren't in the you know, being in that financial position was the catalyst for everything we did. So, I would say I. I would question whether we'd even exist as a group if we didn't have that as a catalyst at the time. Um, if I was to do it again, though, I wouldn't. I would definitely not want to be in that position. I would. Part of 
the pain or the, there was definitely a lot of stress that could have, we could have gone 35K into the, into the red and we could have done it in an explicit way with the, with the parent company. We didn't do that. We just like got paid on these kind of automated payments basically or invoice, but no one was managing the budget. So internally we're tracking the funds and it was just like, oh my God, it's just something happened that we were in debt and we had to have all these stressful meetings. And that's what I would avoid. That's what I wouldn't do. I would be, the thing that I'm, the funny thing is that I see our pod as taking a lot of risk, but I see the way our approach to finance is being quite conservative these days. And I think that that's, that's kind, of, kind of the balance that I'm kind of strike, trying to strike now is that um, good transparency, good documentation and conservatism around finances. Awesome. How are the um, directors chosen at the, at the the, org level? In the new model, I wish to propose. I'm proposing with um, the Golden Pandas. Uh, essentially, the the rule will be there has to be one direct, a minimum of one director per pod. Uh, how they are elected is I, we haven't determined. Uh, oh, how they. Uh, yeah, nominated into the position. I would certainly also like to have external directors as well. Um, I don't know what the process is, but the one rule would be one per pod minimum. Okay. Was there anything that anyone wanted me to come back to? In the initial funding phases for you arriving the pod, um, I kind of like to understand, to unpack that how they, how you chose each other as a as a pod, initial bootstrap debt, because we'd like to understand because we're trying to do something similar here in Toronto with the Imaginarium debt, and doing it in a way with a we want more of these in a federation where the community ongoing supports those efforts through a transparency thing with the community around needs, like rent, and electricity, and stuff, for places like this. And I want to contrast and compare the Inspire model and how you chose each other and chose the fund, how we can do that in a federated manner. Great. Yeah, lovely question. Um, so for the last three, four months, I've been talking about wishing to create another pod. Um, uh, there's set various reasons for that, but um, I haven't got the perfect answer for that. I'd say basically it's really hard. Um, how we went through it was, it was literally who keeps on showing up at these meetings and just kind of going like, who's actually making the commitment here? Because everyone else is just in, out, in, out, one day you were in, one day you are out, now you're going to Auckland, oh, you're back three weeks later, and it was just like literally, okay, who's in, this is the date, everyone make a commitment. And then as far as essentially debt funding uh, or debt, debt bootstrapping, um, the 35K was a mistake that shouldn't have happened, or rather um, the way it happened is kind of what I'm saying, I, I'm not, it should have been done a different way. To get out of the 35K, what we did was we, uh, the way that our formula works is we didn't pay anyone any commission and the base salary at buffer level zero, which means you have no money in the bank account, is three and a half K. And then what we did was we said, we'll do a cap return on the difference between three and a half K to five and a half K multiplied by your full-time equivalents. So if someone is a 0.8, we would take $2,000 a month, multiply it by 0 0.8, take the 1600 bucks, and that goes into a cap return table for them that has a multiplier on it, and they will get paid out. Uh, so that formula is the first one I wrote, and I've never actually published, or I haven't even drawn the second one, which has a built-in system for contributing to the commons and a, and a built-in system for paying out uh, if you owe people money for cap returns. So basically what it means is that once you hit a point where you have 
two times, so two months worth of your collective salary needs, then any income after that, a revenue share will go to the commons, and it will, or if you owe people money, you'll start paying them off. So, uh, so yeah, the, the, I've kind of the the point in there is that ah oh, the the one missing piece in that sorry Chris is to form a group, you have to have a contract. The easiest way to get a contract for a group is to form inside or so, in, uh, next to an existing thing. Dev Academy, we wouldn't have had a contract if not for Dev Academy. Like, I don't think we could have bootstrapped it without Dev Academy. So, Is I think the, the contract for paid work. Yeah, so yeah, you have to, you, get, you need to have contracts and you need to have a way of getting more contracts. And building out that pipeline and building out those relationships takes time and energy and effort. And when you're, uh, yeah, I mean, like, look, if you're established and you've already got networks and contacts and you've already got those things and you can do it yourself, fantastic. We didn't. We relied on Dev Academy for essentially bootstrapping us with some contracts that got us going. And a name and brand. I mean, like, they had all these things and we could just kind of lever off of that. Hmm. So, yeah. Great. Um, we're coming up on the hour. Does anyone else have any questions or comments? Got about eight minutes. Does anyone have a story to share around trust? I'm very curious about this. This is something that I've been toying my head with for quite some time. Yeah. Um, that, that was it was really quite cool that you that you sort of brought that in because it's it's the kind of it's the characteristic of any system that you use. So so my take on on trust is um, is that whatever system or process you use needs to generate trust. It's not something you rely on in order for it to function. So so this is where the sort of agile practice is coming quite handy because it's a system that basically doesn't rely on trust. It generates trust. It says here's transparency. We're going to set out to achieve this. We're going to bite it off in small pieces. But here's, here's what we learned. This is what we achieved. This is what the result was at regular intervals. So at regular intervals, you're given the opportunity to see exactly what's going on. And like you said just now, and I love that idea of making decisions, but you have to take advice. Um, it self-regulates. So over time, over several iterations, you're forming an iterative relationship, uh, iterative um, that will self-create. And it should naturally generate trust. If it's not generating trust, then I think there's something fundamentally <coughs> wrong. Mm. So, so yeah, that would be just one one point to share on that, just to connect with um, with what you brought in. So I appreciate that. Yeah. Nice, thank you. Stories about how Volk uses the five S functions, particularly in the uh, the trust arena with Dan. Sure, um, <clears throat> maybe Watson. Can pitch in as well on that, but uh, I, I appreciate what was just said though on the generating trust, and that ties in with the well example that Dan, uh, Dan had. Um, you do have a well, and sometimes you're going to need to rely on that based on where you are, but you definitely need to be adding to that well. So in, within Volk, um, our co-op, uh, Watson and I, uh, actually several people here on the call, we. Uh, use five dysfunctions as part of our governance process. So five dysfunctions is a, um, I guess it's kind of a process for checking in with the group. It's used in um, a lot of large corporations and stuff as well. But you're starting with Trust within the group is your first area that you need to have uh, before you can get to uh, work through on accountability and other items. I may have to pull up the list here, but and I'll, let me shoot a link over. 
Is that five dysfunctions of a team? Is yes, that, that's it. Yeah, read it. It's just the high of the high of read it. Yeah, it was just interesting to, um, to understand how the guys at Bulk used it as part of a. Thanks for that. What's that? What's that? So, so yeah, how, how did you use it? Okay, so um, we have a work. We're structured with um, partners that are um, equal owners. Uh, we may. Your audio died. I hear you. We lost audio. He's laughing uh, so you can hear how he's standing he's he's really well. Oh. Oh. Okay, you're on the mute. <laughs> <laughs> hey No. Is that? No, uh, we're transmitting. Dan, Dan, you can hear us here. In can y'all hear me? Yep. yep. Okay. Now we're, here. Here. we're good to the computer. Here. So we use um, the five distinctions at the partner level. We're um, structured with partners on the core, which is. Um, the director, direction, management, and worker owned cooperative. And we distribute the executive functions among the partners. Um, we meet every Friday to go through uh, governance. And as part of that process, we use five dysfunctions to check in. Um, and that goes through starting with trust and then um, working your way towards team goals. And this is uh, Patrick Lencioni. I think uh, Watson posted the link there for the five dysfunctions. Um, and that's where we, we check in. And that can be based on your where things are weekly, kind of like retrospectives within a sprint on the Agile side. Um, or we've also used it to check in on a, a quarterly level. So where is the team um, overall for hitting those type of goals, which would be similar to what uh, Dan was saying with regard to splitting the, the cadence for uh, agreements, uh, commitments, and um, roles. Yeah, right. Nice. We had a we had a meeting. Uh, sorry, I'm kind of my brain just um. We had a meeting recently online, uh, which was called the Growth Working Group inside Inspiral. Inspiral's at this point where it, it's going like there's people all over the place now. Like it started as this Wellington group, and now there's people everywhere, and it's it's. Interesting to think of, like, I showed you an org, a, a org chart basically showing two pods and one org. And within the network now, in Spiral Network, I think there's 11 registered ventures and another, like, eight or so proto ventures. So you can Im imagine, like, there's actually, like, another circle, if you like, and you've just got these orgs sitting with inside the network, and then you've got the pods sitting inside the orgs, if you like. And that's one of the things, though, that we came up in the group was, and maybe this is kind of speaking to back to your question, Chris, with, around how do you get another, how do you form groups, and how do you uh, federate? Is the question was posed of like, what would it look like if we split the current community into four? And it wasn't necessarily meant to be like, hey, is this actually legitimately a thing we could pursue? Because we already all knew that it was a no. But it was an interesting thought exercise to think of there's essentially two ways that you can create another pod uh, off of the back of yours is either you clone yourself or somehow like help form another one or you uh, do, like, uh, what, what's it called? My, it's not mitosis, uh, meiosis? I don't know, you, you, you divide in two. 
So um, that, that was like, I, I don't have an answer for that, but that was something that came up in the conversation of how do you naturally scale and like grow more pods essentially in an org, or how do you grow more orgs if you like? Mm. At Bulk, we've experienced that five is about the natural limit for that care and feeding of each other on a personal level. Uh, we do, so I, I is actually the first fork of the culture there at Bulk. Because of my traveling and not being present to physically show up at our um, governance on Fridays, we looked at well, how do I take this stuff and, and, and create a new group? And it's happened naturally by just being at a place and having people show up and they keep showing up and they show because I'm working with people in the States, it's 4 a.m. So they show up at 4 a.m. every day and then they don't leave. And they're realizing these are the other people, right? These are the ones that, that are, are making a change in the world. And so we're like, we have a pot, what do we do with that? And I say, what do we we got wants? We want to have all these wonderful nice things, but what we need is a place to live. And so what, what I did is I, went and I, I made my place available to the pod. And they now live in, in my house and my family and I are just temporarily stepping out of that. So we have this place mm. where we can take the imagination, make it real. People who are technologists that are, have an extra space to invite. And I want to invite anybody in Texas and states or inspired to come and stay in our spare room that we keep available all the time to cross pollinate and figure out how we make livelihood pods a common term and not specific to the Inspire Network or to the Imaginarium Network or to any of these things, which just core value or a community. If I go to Cambodia, I want to go teach someone to do that and they can go hop and do it again. I, anyway, I'll stop. But that's yeah, I, I can't say how excited by the idea I am. <laughs> that would just be like, holy shit, that would be amazing. Uh, the, you reminded me of another conversation which was to do with space uh, and physical location. Inspiral used to have a, uh, a working, a work, a, 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 my, my words are starting to fail me. They had a space called Inspiral Space um, that you know you could go and you could do a desk rent or you could set up your business there and uh, a co-working space. Oh, God, brain. Um, and then it wound up for various reasons over a year ago, and um, and it, it's really interesting seeing that the pain I would I would literally describe it as a pain for a, a kind of, of not having that home. That's been really really hard for the Wellington and Spiral community from of having a home to not having a home, and I think that. I think it's been a really interesting transition because there's also been a case of like a bunch of ventures, kind of especially Inspire Dev Academy being one of them. Rabbit, um, Lumio have now got a new location, and I'm um, and now there are multiple locations, and you can kind of go and hang in various spaces, and that's the interesting thing. But it's still not quite the same as having that core central space, which is that co-working space. So. Yeah, the, the conversation was talking about the opportunity of starting a new Inspiral co-working space. Not so much as like a side product of network, but rather as a venture in its own right. And I think that, that yeah, I think that's super important to have that physical, yeah, the physical center. Mm. I'm kind of noticing that we've gone a few minutes over, and I, I'm, I'm very respectful of people's time. So um, I'm OK. If anyone has any more questions or thoughts, I would love to answer them or hear them. Um, please just reach out. Um, I will, I'm real happy to share my slides as well if anyone wants them. And I'll put some contact details on the, on the, uh, uh, the last slide of that deck so that anyone that gets the deck has my contact details if they want them. Yeah, and I just thank you all. Yeah, it's been great. Thank you very much. Brilliant.
Thank if you all have any thoughts on a um, topic for next month, um, feel free to post it on Meetup or YouTube or send it over to me. Um, we'll get something scheduled. Thanks a lot again, Dan. Appreciate it. Anytime. I like talking to good people.